We celebrate that you are risen. The victory that you have over death has allowed us to be set free. We are so grateful and thankful that you have defeated death in the grave. And we can come and we can lift your name high this morning. That we can proclaim together that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Thanks, Ben and Melinda, <clears throat> and welcome to Central Baptist Church in Clifton Springs. Join us. It's Easter Sunday, and we're going to worship God, we're going to worship His Son, and we're going to participate with His Holy Spirit as we do it. We may be in our homes, but we are together. We are the church, the body of Christ, and He is alive. Please sing along. Um, I'm getting the words up the best way that I can for you to be able to do that. And um, as far as announcements go, please read your newsletter and watch the emails that come in between for important updates. Let's continue to worship and soak in Easter together, the true Easter. I even have a kid's video um, in a couple of moments, so I'll hand back to Melinda for a moment. What a strange time we find ourselves in that we have to celebrate Easter in this way. But we are not alone here and the whole world is going through exactly the same thing at the moment. But, you know, we can't come together in our church building, but we can still come together united in heart and spirit. And Jesus Christ is still Lord. He always has been and he always will be. And us being locked in will not stop his glory from being known throughout this world. So we just pray that this morning that the world over will know the true meaning of Easter as we celebrate together. And let's have a watch of this kids video together. Jesus and took him away. His friends were afraid and ran off. The leaders asked Jesus, are you the son of God? And Jesus said, yes. The leaders didn't like that. The soldiers hurt Jesus and made fun of him. And they gave him a little hat, was like spiky to hurt his head. And they gave him a big heavy cross to carry. him up on his hands and feet. Some people shouted at Jesus. If you really are God's son, then just climb down. Jesus could have climbed down. He could have made it stop, but he stayed there. Because he loves us, it was all part of the plan. Then Jesus died. And Mary and everyone cried. The sky got really dark. The 
sun couldn't shine. Maybe because the badness was all in it, making God feel sad. They put Jesus' body in a tomb. And they pushed a huge stone in front of the door so no one could get in. Three days later, God sent an angel from heaven. When the soldiers saw the angel, they got scared and ran off. children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. And isn't it like that today, even as we celebrate Easter, that Satan thought that he had defeated Jesus. Jesus had died on the cross. He'd gone to the grave and Satan thought that he had won. But God said no. God said, I have the victory. And through his death, through Jesus' death on the cross, he has brought the victory because he has paid for our sin and Jesus was raised to life. Let's go into our prayer time thinking of Jesus having the victory. Our Lord God Almighty, we bring you all the praise, all the honour, and all the glory this morning. We celebrate this Easter morning that through the resurrection of Jesus, death and the grave has been defeated and that Jesus is alive and has the victory. We thank you for the cross, 
for the sacrifice and the suffering that made a way for each of us to be forgiven and set free, to know you personally and the hope of life forever with you. In the midst of this time of uncertainty, of confusion, of change, we know that you never change. We pray that you will bring us assurance of your love and remind us of the times when you have proven your faithfulness to us. In the midst of the storm and the raging seas, you are our God that still the wind and the waves. And we pray that you'll bring that peace into our hearts. As each of us face our own challenges and struggles that this coronavirus has brought to our lives, we do think of those who are also facing other challenges, who are facing health issues at this time. We continue to pray and bring before you Doug Doval as he faces failing health and issues with his kidneys. Lord, we thank you for the great faith and assurance that Doug and Pam have in you, Lord. And we pray that you'll continue to bring them and their wider family comfort, strength and peace at this time. Lord, we also continue to pray for Helen Brood and for the healing of her leg and her ankle. And Lord, we know that healing is taking place even if it's slow. But Lord, we pray for, for peace amidst decisions that need to be made this week for her and the next steps that need to be taken. Lord, we also think of others in our fellowship and you may know of others that you know, I'm not aware of, but Lord, we, we think of Steve and Linda Vans this morning. And Lord, we think of Dave and Beck as they are enjoying Mackenzie coming to their family. Lord, we think of Margaret Collins as well as she continues her healing. And just in this moment, I just ask that you just bring others before the Lord that you know in your heart. Lord, we bring to you the many people in our church family and in this community that are struggling with being separated and isolated. People that are alone at this time. People that don't have family members around them. Lord, there is so much loneliness and anxiety and fear amidst this situation. We pray that you'll bring comfort to those people. We pray that you'll help families and communities to find new ways to connect and stay in touch with one another. Lord, we thank you for this time when your church is being forced to move out of the comfort of building, out of the comfort of four walls, and we're able to take your love and truth to the world around us, to others in new and creative ways. We do pray for the leaders at this time leaders of our country, leaders of other countries who are making big decisions on behalf of us. Lord, we pray that you'll bring wisdom, that you'll bring strength to them. Lord, we pray for our leaders of our local churches, Lord, and our own pastor, Andrew. We bring him before you this morning as, as he learns new ways to connect with our body and our people. We pray that you'll bring him peace and stillness and strength and comfort in this time. Lord, we lift our children before you, our children in this fellowship and in our families and the children in this community. Lord, it is different for them and they struggle to understand as we do what's going on. Lord, as they go back to a different kind of schooling this week, we pray that you will help them to settle, to find new routines, new ways of, of being settled, that you'll bring patience and grace to parents. Lord, that you will indeed unite families during this time. Lord, I just thank you that we can come, we can lay all these things at your feet. 
But Lord, I thank you that we can come and we can proclaim your name. That we can still proclaim your name. And that in this time more than ever before, your name will be loudly proclaimed throughout this community and throughout this world. We're going to sing. We're going to proclaim the name of the Lord. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Let's sing together.
He's not here. He has risen. <clears throat> the words of an angel. A supernatural announcement. It was an announcement directly from God. It was just what they needed to hear. It was just as Jesus had told them over and over what would happen. It was simple. It was direct. Yet it took them a, a bit of a process to believe. To believe with their eyes what they had seen. To believe with their ears what they had heard. To believe even what their hands had felt and touched. Ha! It must have been delivered to mere humans just like us, like you and me. It was a bit mystifying because this sort of thing had never, ever happened before. It had never happened in the history of the world ever before. He is not here. He has risen. Here. I'll read you um, John's account. Mary obviously didn't, didn't fill him in on all of the details when she first went and saw him. Uh, I suppose she was pretty frantic uh, when she found out that Jesus wasn't in his tomb. But Luke gives us, gives us a detail of, angel, of the angels who met them in that empty tomb that morning and heralded those words to her and to the world he is not here, he has risen. Here's John's story of events, his testimony, I would say. John 20, verses 1 to 10. Early on the first day of the week, while, he was, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, and he looked in at the strips of linen laying there. But he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The disciples went back to where they were staying. I could just imagine the conversation on the way back and when they got there. The announcement had been made to the world. It had been entrusted first into the hands of, of the women who cared for and loved Jesus, the ones who he had lived alongside, who he had walked with, talked with and eaten with, the ones who had sat at his feet with the men and actually heard his teaching. He performed miracles that had not only amazed them, but had turned their lives around, taken the emptiness and filled their lives with hope and a future. No more. No more so than Mary Magdalene. Although we don't know a lot about Mary, we do know that she had deep distress in her life. She suffered emotionally, she suffered mentally, she suffered spiritually, and as always with that little trio, she suffered physically. All at the hands of seven demons that had plagued her all of her life. She met Jesus and he cast them out. Her life changed. Her loves and desires had been totally reordered. Her encounter with Jesus, her friendship with Jesus before the cross brought miraculous transformation and wholeness to her life. Now he was dead. The friendship 
ended abruptly by death. So she thought. Early at that first Easter Sunday, she discovered the empty tomb. In a little while, she would be the very first person to have the risen Jesus Christ reveal himself to her. A woman, an unreliable witness. Women could not even testify in a court of law about anything in those days. The risen Jesus Christ chose her to be the first Christian eyewitness. God always seems to choose the least likely to be important witnesses for him. Remember the shepherds at Christmas time? And there are others. If you were fabricating this story, no one would have chosen Mary Magdalene to be the first one. The one who had come looking for a dead Jesus. And she was looking for him behind a stone that weighed who knows how much that would have had to have been moved before she could even get access to serve the dead Jesus. Mary certainly hadn't thought it through. Her belief came in a different way. Hearing, touch and emotion featured large in Mary's believing. Well, she never had to move, move the stone. She never had to attend to a dead Jesus. It was the third day there was now no dead Jesus. God, his father, had raised him from death to life. When she met the resurrected Jesus, her old friendship with Jesus sort of launched her into a new relationship with the risen Jesus Christ. There was close friendship before the cross. Then there was an even closer, more intimate friendship after he was resurrected to life through death. This shows us something profound and new. It shows us that if we have a relationship with Jesus in our life, that, that relationship will carry you through the now smashed barrier of death into a, rela a relationship that will last for all eternity. Jesus smashed it on the cross and he makes eternal relationship available for all who believe and are willing to be filled with that new life. John 20, verses 17 and 18, when he was talking to Mary, this shows what I'm saying. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all that he had said to her. What we have here is the Gospel of John. What we have is a first-hand eyewitness account of knowing Jesus. John says, often, I was there, I was in the room, I saw this, I was, I was the disciple that Jesus loved. I was there. How often do you wish when you read the Gospels, as you walk through them in your mind and meditate on them, as you take them in, how often do you wish you could have heard his voice, seen his face, experienced him in the everyday stuff, stuff like passing the salt and pepper um, to him over the dinner table type knowing him. Now all of a sudden, Jesus is saying, you can, John is saying, you can never know the Jesus before the resurrection like I knew him. You can never know what we knew. The Jesus of chapters 1 to 19. I was there, you weren't. But the Jesus of chapter 20 and chapter 21, the Jesus of after the resurrection, you can know him like us. That's what he's saying. He's saying you can know 
just like us. You can know the risen Lord. You can have the very, very same knowledge, the very same fellowship that we have with him. He's available. He's still here. However, you have to believe. I normally jump over um, the story of the guys having a bit of a, a foot race um, to the empty tomb, then taking a peek into the tomb, verses 3 to 9. But in my, my walk through the story this year, as I slowly read John 20, these words caught my attention. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight to the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They saw the empty tomb. They saw the evidence. No, they weren't CSI detectives or for forensic investigators. They weren't like the people on that um, TV show, Silent Witness. I watched it with Dawn on Friday night. If they were, they would be hard pressed to do an autopsy. And they always seem to be doing autopsies on those shows. Why would they be hard pressed? Because there was no body. Bodies are dead. The body had been, this body had been resurrected and made new. It had become a living, breathing, eating, eternal body that was bound by no bounds. Nothing could contain him. This was the real Jesus in his resurrection flesh. Although over the centuries, this scene has been dissected and examined and many hypotheses put forward trying to dismiss it. All have failed, as it cannot be dismissed. As they stood in amazement, looking at the scene of the empty tomb, Peter and John's process of reasoning went into overdrive. As they looked at the scene, a scene that seemed impossible. Although John got there first, he stops and he looks in to try to work it out. Peter catches up and goes straight into the scene of the evidence of the resurrection as soon as he arrives. They are looking and they see. It says that they see, that they saw. In verse 1, Mary saw that the stone was rolled away. The Greek word see, blepo, means her eyes saw it. Her sense of seeing looked. Her retina, her um, eyes took it in. She got the information that hit her brain. But the word see in verse 6 is different. It's the Greek word theoria, which means to reason, to scrutinise, to theorise, to weigh, to ponder. Something they're seeing is making their reason go into overdrive. The process of forming belief is spinning faster than the hard drive in my computer. Something is forming in John. He, he tells us in verse 8 what it was. He says he finally went in and he believed. The grave clothes were lying there, there. So what, you might say? Of course they would be lying there. He wouldn't need them anymore. Well, that would be if... He were alive. Lazarus had to have people unwrap him. Remember Jesus said, help him out of his grave clothes when he came out of the grave? They would have been left in a heap on the ground. Well, that would be the case if Jesus was alive, just totally humanly alive, that is. If he had just revived in the tomb. The Greek word for laying was used that was used here means to be laying in order, to be laying in an orderly way. This doesn't mean that they were folded up neatly. It's not like that they had OCD grave robbers um, back then. This, if grave robbers had stolen the body, they would have taken the body still wrapped up, 
because it would be smelly, it would be oozy, um, it didn't make sense. And it would have been the same if anybody on the disciple side had taken it. The body was wrapped like a mummy, completely around. In Jesus' case, inside those wrappings were, with the body, about 45 kilos of spices, myrrh and aloes. And the face was open and a separate wrapping around his head. They were realising that if Jesus had just revived, he would have had to tear them off. Almost impossible. They see the grave, grave, grave clothes lying there in order. But what's really gotten them is they must still be wrapped. They're still rolled up in the shape of a body. So there'd be no way for them to be in order if somebody had ripped them apart. Not only that, the clincher is that the head wrapping was right where the head should be. It wasn't on top of the other stuff. It wasn't laying around. The head roll was still rolled up, still folded up. It's often translated folded, but the Greek term is rolled. It was still rolled up right where the head was, right there, away from the rest of the, the linen. Michael Green, a, a New Testament scholar, says, they saw the grave clothes still wound around but empty, as if the body had passed right through, looking like a chrysalis after the butterfly had left. And Michael Green said, and the butterfly had left. There's almost no other possible reason why it would be mentioned three times, why they were so electrified by it, why it brought John to the point of belief. He had just gained faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ. It was now cemented in his soul and he would never, ever be the same again. And he hadn't even connected the dots of scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead to fulfil scripture as it had been prophesied for centuries. And strangely, none of them seemed to remember before this point that Jesus had said to them over and over again that he would rise on the third day. They'd not even been there bright and early expecting, hoping that he, they would find a risen saviour. What was the level of their faith directly after his death? I would say on a scale of one to ten, zero. It wasn't even on the scale. John's reasoning had just cracked the case for him and he was still yet to meet Jesus in his resurrected body before he ascended to his father. He believed before he saw him. Mary believed when he called her by name. Thomas had to see for himself, remember? He had to check out his hands and his feet and his side. And all of the more than 500 people who saw Jesus after his resurrection came to belief in the risen Christ in different ways. Belief in Jesus, believing in the resurrected Jesus is the pivotal point of faith. All the English translations of the Gospel of John continually say they believed in Jesus. Tim Keller points out that believed in is abstract. Believed in is vaporous. Believed in is general. It's always, it always is. He believed into Jesus. It's always the little Greek word is into. It's the way in which it is grammatically placed. It's so awkward that it translators never try to deal with it. You will never understand what real faith is. John is saying here, you haven't believed in Jesus if you've only believed in Jesus. You have to believe into Jesus. John believed into Jesus in the resurrection Here's, here's what that means. The word into. It, 
it so much it costs. As I thought about it, I thought, Brian Ellis brought a wheelbarrow into church a few years ago and told us the story of the famous tightrope walker, Charles Blondin, from the end of the 19th century, and how he would push a wheelbarrow across a tightrope that was suspended over Niagara Gorge. It was 340 metres wide, that's wide, and the tightrope was stretched 50 metres above the raging river. And he would do it. He would walk across that tightrope first, holding onto a pole. And then he'd come back and he'd say, do you believe I can do it without a pole? They'd say, yeah, we believe. So he'd do it without a pole. Then he would say, do you believe I can push this wheelbarrow across the gorge? They said, yes, we believe he would do that. And he'd come back. The crowds would cheer and they would say, and then he would say, do you believe I could push a man in this barrow across that tightrope over that raging torrent? And they would all sound, shout, yes, yes, we believe. They believed in London. But when he asked for a volunteer to get into the barrow and let him carry them across, they all went quiet and only a few ever did. They all believed in Blondin. Only a few believed into Blondin, into his wheelbarrow, and placed their lives in his hands. Believing in Blondin and his wheelbarrow may prove that you have courage, you have a fair bit of guts, I would reckon. Might bring you some fame, might bring you some personal glory, but it won't last long. However, when it comes to Jesus, believing into Jesus means that you can trust him every time, for all eternity. He will never go off track. He will never drop you over the side. He will never let you down. You can step out on him. You can risk it. You can commit to him completely. To believe into means I'm willing to lean on, to depend on to trust. To believe into Jesus means you want him. Believing into Jesus in John's mind means I'm going to believe he died for me. I'm going to believe he rose for me. We may come to Christianity by an emotional experience, but then we have to, to get the rational. We have to explore him and the evidence that he gives us if we're going to have sustained growth. And those of us who are coming to believe sort of rationally, trying to think it through, you have to get experiential or you will not have a sustained growth either. There is no real right order other than turning from your sin and turning to Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't just prescribe one set of stages to go through. For us, in 2020, he simply lays out the evidence, he gives us his word, the Bible, and he leads us into the empty tomb and says that all begins here for you. For it to begin, you need to believe Jesus had to die for you and you need to believe that he had to rise for you. The grave was now empty and the world was being filled. In the words of an angel, it's true, he is not here, he is risen. Let's pray. Loving Father, Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for giving your Son, Jesus Christ, for us. Thank you for shattering the barrier of death and making a way through it. A way through that we can take, led by your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we follow your Son. May we have rich relationship with him in this life, knowing that it will continue on when our time on earth is done. May we believe and know that he rose for us.
to cement our relationship with him for all eternity. May we enter his kingdom today. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. we come to the end of our time together, let us sing about the God who has saved us. Who can compare to our God? Who can compare to his great love? Who else can take our sins away? Who can compare to our God?
And man, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God give you his presence in your going out and your staying in and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labour and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you.